Welcome to lecture number 12. In the previous lecture, I established the global stable model structure on the category of orthogonal spectra. And here's the statement again on the whiteboard. So in this model structure, the equivalences are the global equivalences, and the co-fibrations are the so-called flat co-fibrations. So these are those morphisms of orthogonal spectra, such that for every m greater or equal to zero, the relative latching map is an OM equivariant co-fibration. The latching maps came from the skeleton filtration of an orthogonal spectrum and they record how the stuff below some dimension maps to the stuff in a fixed dimension. The stable model structure on orthogonal spectra has a bunch of convenient technical properties. It's topological, it's proper, it's covariantly generated and, very importantly, it's stable. A key ingredient and one of the main mathematical points in the establishment of this global stable model structure was that a specific class of morphisms that detect the global omega spectra are global equivalences. So these morphisms are denoted by lambda g d w, and here's again their source and target. Here g runs over all compact Lie groups, v and w run over g representations, and w has to be a faithful g representation. The previous lecture was rather long, and in the end I only mentioned that there is an explicit criterion for what the vibrations in the global stable model structure are, and I now want to write down what this criterion is. So a morphism of orthogonal spectra, f from x to y, is a global vibration. If two conditions hold, well, first of all, if F is a strong level vibration, so the vibration in the strong level model structure, and that's explicitly meant if you evaluate it on Rm with the standard inner product, then it has to be an OM equivariant vibration, which in turn means that for every closed subgroup of OM on the fixed points, you get a self vibration. This is one condition, and then there's a second condition. Moreover, for every compact D group G, and all G representations V and W, such that W is faithful, The following commutative square is somewhat of a Cartesian. So here we take the value of x at w, g fixed points, going to based g equivariant maps from the v sphere into the value of x at v plus w. This is the adjoint structure map, and then g fixed points, and then the same thing for y y of w g via the air joint structure map of y, taking g fixed points, going to base g equivariant maps from s v into y of v plus w. Down here we have the morphism f evaluated at w and then g fixed points. And down here we have base g equivariant maps from s v into the value of f this is a commutative square of non-equivalent spaces, and this square has to be homotopy Cartesian because the vertical maps here and here are both self vibrations, that's a consequence of the strong level vibration property. Being homotopy Cartesian means something very explicit, it just means that the map from this vertex, the initial point in the square, to the strict pullback of the rest is a weak homotopy equivalence of non-equivalent spaces. So these global vibrations are the vibrations in the global stable model structure. So part of the theorem is that these are exactly the maps with a right lifting property with respect to morphisms that are simultaneously flat co-vibrations and global equivalences. Now if you specialize this to Y being a point, that means we're talking about objects that are fibrant in the global stable model structure. Well then all of these things are points. And the fact that the square is homotopy Cartesian just means that this map is a weak equivalence for all G, V, and W as above. So this means 
that the fiber objects are exactly the global omega spectra. Fiber objects in the global stable model structure. Uh, what I call the global omega spectrum. So this is what I meant last time when I said that the global vibrations are a relative version of the global omega spectrum. As I mentioned before, the global stable homotopy category is the localization of the category of orthogonal spectra at the class of global equivalences. I want to denote by gamma the localization factor, which comes with a construction which enjoys universal property. Let the, this be the localization functor. So in other words, it has the universal example of a localization. It takes global equivalences to isomorphisms, and for every other functor from orthogonal spectra to an arbitrary category that takes global equivalences to isomorphisms, there will be a unique factorization through the global homotopy category. So this is a localization in the one category of categories. Um, we can insist, and we want to insist, that they actually have the same objects because this can always be arranged, so we assume that the objects of the global homotopy, stable homotopy category are, again, all orthogonal spectra, and that gamma is the identity of objects. This is just convenient, and we can then confuse by use of notation objects in spectra and objects in the global stable homotopy category. Of course, this is also a little bit dangerous because we're using the same notation for objects in two different categories, but I think we can handle that. Um, general model category theory, and this is now where the model structure comes in handy, tells us how to calculate morphisms in the global homotopy category, at least in specific cases. It tells us that we have a cofibrant object in the source and a fibrant object in the target. So in our situation, for a flat orthogonal spectrum A, these are the cofibrant objects. And global omega spectrum X, these are the fibrant objects. Well, in such a situation, you can always calculate morphisms in the homotopy category of a model category as homotopy classes of actual morphisms. More precisely, this will mean that the effect of the functor on morphisms, spectrum morphisms from A to X, to morphisms in the global homotopy category, for this I will introduce a convenient piece of notation. So I use this kind of double bar brackets to denote morphisms in the global stable homotopy category. So first of all, this is subjective. Every morphism from a cofibrant to a fibrant object is realized in the homotopy category, is realized by a morphism in the model category. And also, two morphisms become the same if and only if they are homotopic. So in complete generality, this would be this abstract homotopy relation defined by abstract cylinders and abstract path objects. But because we're in a topological model category, this is actually the concrete homotopy relation. So a continuous one parameter family of morphisms of orthogonal spectrum. So this is what the model category structure buys us, that we can explicitly calculate morphisms here, at least for particular kinds of objects, cofibrant and fibrant. But of course, up to global equivalence, everything can be cofibrantly replaced or fibrantly being replaced. An important consequence of the fact that the global model structure is stable is that we get a triangulated structure. This is something that I'd already mentioned in one of the earlier classes and then I've given you a bunch of references and here are the references one more time. So in general if you have a stable model structure there's a preferred structure of triangulated category on the homotopy category. One possible reference is to Hobby's book. Another reference is which 
uh, works more generally for stable cofibration categories to a paper of mine. An alternative approach would be to first pass to the quasi-category, which is then also stable, and then appeal to a general theorem of Lurie's, which says that the homotopy category of a stable infinity category also comes with a preferred triangulation. So because this triangulated structure is important for what we're doing, I want to briefly review how the structure comes about and not just refer you to these references. So a triangulated structure in particular comes with a shift functor, which has to be an auto-equivalence. And here's how this goes in our situation. The triangulated structure of the global stable homotopy category. So we observe that the suspension functor smashing with S1 from orthogonal spectra to orthogonal spectra, so you level-wise smashing with S1. This preserves global equivalences. So it descends uniquely to the homotopy category. So let me explain this one once in complete detail and then later just say that something descends by the same kind of argument. So here we have the category with equivalences. Here I have the functor smashing with S1. Here I have the localization functor to the global stable homotopy category. Here I also have the localization functor to the global stable homotopy category. Now if you have a global equivalence here, it becomes it's still a global equivalence here. It becomes an isomorphism when you go down here. So this composite is a functor that sends global equivalences to isomorphisms. And hence, the universal property of the localization gives us a unique functor down here, such that the square of functors commutes on the nose, not just up to natural isomorphism. And I'm going to abuse the notation in this situation and in similar situations by giving this induced functor the same name. This is just convenient. It's, of course, a little bit dangerous because, strictly speaking, it's a different functor, but it's very convenient. And this is the shift functor in the triangulated structure. And then the same argument, similarly, functor omega from orthogonal spectra to orthogonal spectra, that is at every level taking the loop space descends. I mean, this is also a functor that takes global equivalences to global equivalences. So it descends to a functor where, again, I will abuse notation, use the same name. This also gives us a functor downstairs. And we know even more. We have the unit and the co-unit of the adjunctions, eta, from an orthogonal spectrum to the loop spectrum of x smash s1 and the co-unit of the adjunction from the loop spectrum of x smash s1 back to x. So these are global equivalences. And hence they descend to natural transformations between the derived functors on the homotopy category level. And so they become natural isomorphisms in the global homotopy category. Send to natural isomorphisms in GH. In particular, that this drive shift functor is an auto equivalence of the global state homotopy category. This is, of course, one of the properties we need to have. The shift functor has to be a self equivalence of the triangulated category. A property that a triangulated category needs to have is that it has to be an additive category. So why is this the case for the global stable homotopy category? So the argument here is exactly the same as for the non-equivalent stable model structure on orthogonal spectra. So I explained this argument in detail a year ago when I taught the class on non-equivalent stable homotopy theory. 
So I will be very brief here because it's completely parallel. So the first observation is that co-products in the global homotopy category are represented by wedges of flat spectra. So this is a piece of general model category theory again. Co-products in the homotopy category exist and you can take Feynman replacements of the objects and take the co-product in the model, in this case the wedge of orthogonal spectra, and this represents co-products. And vibrant and products in the global homotopy category, they also exist, and they are represented by, and then of course, products of vibrant objects, so in this case of global omega spectra. And then to show that the global homotopy category is pre-additive, we need to show that in the homotopy category, the preferred map from a finite co-product to a finite product is an isomorphism, but we know that the canonical map from a finite wedge to a finite product of the same factors is a global equivalence. So by applying this to co-fibrant and fibrant replacements, this becomes an isomorphism in the global homotopy category. So this shows that the global homotopy category is pre-additive. It has finite co-products, finite products, and that they are isomorphic via the canonical map. This also implies that we get natural abelian monoid structures on all the morphism sets, but we need to know that these abelian monoid structures are actually group structures, that they have additive inverses. And that also is the same argument as in the non equivalent case, because we also observe that the, the shear map, the shear morphism from x wedge x to x product x. So this is the morphism which on the first wedge sum end is the inclusion of the first sum end at zero here, and on the second wedge sum end it's the diagonal. So slightly informally speaking, it's the morphism represented by this upper triangular matrix. This is a global equivalence. Why is it a global equivalence? Well, if you apply equivalent homotopy groups to this morphism, you exactly get the map given by this upper triangular matrix on equivalent homotopy groups. Equivalent homotopy groups are groups, so they have additive inverses, so that's always a bijection, and that proves that this is a global equivalence. And that's a criterion for when this pre-additive structure is actually an additive structure. So in particular, the HOM sets in the global stable homotopy category have a natural abelian group structure, such that moreover, composition is additive in each of the two variables. So this completes the argument, or at least the sketch argument, why the global stable homotopy category is additive. And then there's one final piece of structure that I have to explain to get a triangulated structure, namely the distinguished triangles, or sometimes called the exact triangles. And here again, the argument is exactly the same as in the non-equivariant situation, and is in fact the same argument as in an arbitrary stable model category. The distinguished triangles arise from co sequences. So here is this in a little bit more detail. Distinguished triangles. So first we have a special class which come from morphisms in the model, in the category of orthogonal spectra. And these are called the elementary distinguished triangles. The elementary distinguished triangle of a morphism of orthogonal spectra. triangle now in the global homotopy category. If I take x, y, then the mapping cone of f. So this is level-wise taking the reduced mapping cone. And then I take x smash s1, the suspension. I mean, this is the form that a distinguished triangle should have. Three morphisms. The last object should be the shift applied to the first object. And here I take essentially f, but now 
I want to take a get a triangle in the homotopy category, so I apply the localization functor to this f. Here I apply the localization functor to the inclusion or the embedding of y into the mapping cone. And here I apply the localization functor to a specific collapse morphism that basically in the mapping cone collapses um, the y to a point and then identifies 0, 1 with endpoints identified with the circle. So this depends on an explicit identification between 0, 1, the interval coordinate is coming up in the mapping cone and the homeomorphism to S1, for which I give a specific formula. This is a small detail. It is not important how you identify 0, 1 with endpoints identified with the circle, but it's important that you commit yourself to one. I mean, you shouldn't change the horses during the race. The, basically, the choice is just a choice of sign. I mean, you, if you chose a different identification, the worst thing that could happen is that you've reversed the orientation somewhere, which would turn this morphism into its negative, and then you would get an isomorphic but a different triangulation. In any triangulation on a triangulated category, there's always the negative triangulation, where in the old distinguished triangles you insert either one minus sign or equivalently three minus signs, and that's always an isomorphic triangulation but a different one. So, as I said, it's not important how you identify this, but you should commit yourself to one identification and always work with that. Another detail that is important is that in order to define the elementary distinguished triangles, we have to start from an actual morphism on the points at level. And this is kind of relevant because arbitrary morphisms in the global homotopy category are not in the image of the localization functor. Of course, after replacing source and target, they will become images of morphisms of orthogonal spectra, but an arbitrary morphism for arbitrary x and y is not necessarily of the form gamma of some f. So that means we have to close these up under isomorphisms of triangles now, and this is the standard way how the triangulated structure is defined. A triangle in the global homotopy category is distinguished if and only if it is isomorphic was isomorphic in here to the elementary distinguished triangle of some morphism of orthogonal spectra. And then the expected theorem, for which I've already given you a bunch of references, is that we do get a triangulated structure. The shift functor blank smash S1, and now I mean the one, the descended one, on the global homotopy category, and the class of distinguished triangles that I've just defined, make the global stereo homotopy category into a triangulated category. The triangulated structure is something that we basically get for free from the stable model structure. Well, for free means by just applying some general theorems to our particular situation. So now I want to get to some properties of the global stable homotopy category that are more special and more particular to our situation. So the first is that we have arbitrary co-products and products and that they are often but not always realized on the level of orthogonal spectra. So here is a proposition. It has three parts. The first part is that the localization functor gamma from orthogonal spectra to the global stable homotopy category preserves coproducts. And now I mean arbitrary coproducts, not necessarily finite. 
In the category of orthogonal spectra, these coproducts are given by wedges, and this really means that wedges exist, or coproducts exist in the global stable homotopy category, and they can be calculated by simply wedging all the objects together, irrespective of whether these are flat or profiled or not. And in particular, this means that this has coproducts. In particular, GH has coproducts. And of course, the emphasis is on infinite coproducts, finite coproducts we already have because we have an additive structure. And the situation with products is a little bit worse than this, but the localization functor at least preserves finite products. The fact that finite products exist, we already knew because it's an additive category, but this means that finite products can actually be calculated by just taking the products of the orthogonal spectra. You don't have to take global omega spectrum replacements for this. And then the third thing I want to record is that the global stable homotopy category has infinite products. It has arbitrary products with the emphasis on infinite ones. But of course, I'm writing it this way because you should remember that arbitrary products are not in general calculated by just taking the product of the orthogonal spectra. You have to first fibrantly replace the individual spectra, meaning you choose a global equivalence to a global omega spectrum, and then you take the product of all these global omega spectrum replacements, and that represents a product in the homotopy category. I don't want to give a proof, I just want to comment on how you get this and why this holds and works, and then give you a reference. The point being that the argument, again, is exactly the same as for the non-equivalent stable model structure that I talked about a year ago. So the proof of part one is the fact that wedges are completely homotopical because the abstract procedure to construct coproducts would be to take flat replacements, wedge those together, and this would be your coproducts. But since arbitrary wedges of global equivalences are global equivalences, the wedge of the flat replacements maps by a global equivalence to the wedge of the original spectra, so those actually also are coproducts in the global homotopy category. The argument for part two for finite products is exactly the same but dualized, and it hinges on the fact that finite products of global equivalences are global equivalences. Infinite products of global equivalences are not in general global equivalences, and that's the reason why here there's the restriction to finite products. And I already said how you get arbitrary products, you take all global omega spectrum replacement and take the product of those. Now I want to briefly mention that also the smash product descends to the global homotopy category. The smash product of orthogonal spectra admits a left derived functor for which I call the derived smash product. And this is a functor with two on, of two variables on the global homotopy category. And you can also derive the associativity, unitality, and commutativity isomorphisms. And this becomes, which is part of a closed symmetric monoidal structure. Moreover, the derived smash product is exact is an exact function of triangulated categories in each variable. Smash L is exact in each variable. And the unit object is the sphere spectrum, which happens to be flat, so there's no deriving necessary for this. So the global stable homotopy category under the derived smash product is what's sometimes called a tensor triangulated category. I don't want to go into details about this because the smash product is only something I'm talking about a little bit on the side. I'm not going, I'm not focusing very much on multiplicative aspects, but it would be a shame not to at least mention it at this point. So here 
we actually have to derive something, or at least I wouldn't know how to do it otherwise, because as far as I know, the smash product is not completely homotopical for global equivalences in both variables without any hypothesis. I don't even know whether it's fully homotopical for non-equivalent stable equivalences in, either, in each variable. Although the curious thing is that I also don't know a counterexample. This is actually an open question whether or not the smash product of orthogonal spectra might be fully homotopical without cofibrancy hypothesis for the non-equivalent pi star isomorphisms or for the global equivalences. I don't know the answer. But what I do know is, and that's a key ingredient here, key ingredient is that at least if one of the factors is flat, so cofibrant in the stable model structure, then it is homotopical. So for all flat orthogonal spectra A, the counter A smash blank from orthogonal spectra to orthogonal spectra preserves global equivalences. Here's a reference. And this also means that if you want to calculate the derived smash pattern of two orthogonal spectra, then you only have to flat replace one of the two factors, that's enough, and then you can smash them together. In lecture 5, I established a representability result for the G-equivariant zeroth homotopy group functor. There is a slightly different but very closely related representability result in the global state homotopy category that I would like to explain now. For this, we consider a compact Lie group G and then the functor of zeroth G equivariant homotopy groups, pi zero G equivariant from the category of orthogonal spectra to the category of abelian groups. This takes global equivalences to isomorphisms by definition of global equivalences. So by the universal property, it descends to the global homotopy category. And again, I want to use notation. and use the same notation for the functor on the global homotopy category. This abuse is convenient, but of course it's slightly dangerous. If I was completely formal, I would give this a different name, maybe pi zero g hat, and then the precise statement would be that pi zero g hat after the localization functor is equal to the original pi zero g, and that uniquely specifies this derived functor. But I will not give it a hat, I will just call it by the same name, and we have to be careful to always be clear about which of the functors we are actually talking about. Let me recall that there was the stable tautological class, which played an important role in the first representability result. I denoted this by EG, and it lives in pi zero G equivariant of the unreduced suspension spectrum of the global classifying space of G. And this is the homotopy class for which we can write down an explicit representative. And it's represented by the continuous spaced G map from S V to S V smash linear isometric embeddings from V into V modulo G plus. So what's this V? Well, in the definition of a global classifying space, we had to choose a faithful G representation that was always called V and that is omitted from the notation here. And then we can take a vector V in the unit sphere and send it to V smash and then the G orbit of the identity of V. This is a G equivalent map. And this is exactly the value of the unreduced suspension spectrum of the global classifying space of G at V. So a G equivariant map based map like this represents an element in pi zero G equivariant, and this was the stable tautological class. And here comes another very important representability result. So theorem uh, for every compact E group G.
with every orthogonal spectrum X. The map from morphisms in the global stable homotopy category of the unreduced suspension spectrum of the global classifying space of X. These are isomorphic to the zero G equivalent homotopy group of X. The map takes a morphism here, F, and it sends it to high zero G of F applied to the stable topological class. So this is saying that the pair consisting of the unreduced suspension spectrum of the global classifying space and the stable topological class represents the functor pi zero upper G as a functor on the global homotopy category. Please be aware that our abuse of notation is in force here and you have to be a little bit careful. You know, we're really talking about the derived pi zero functor because an arbitrary f in the global homotopy category is of course not in general given by a morphism of orthogonal spectra but only a zigzag. But this has a meaning because the functor already descended because it takes local equivalences to bijections. Let me give you a proof of this result. This result is in the Global Homotopy Theory book. Here is the reference, and you can find a proof there. Again, I would like to give you an alternative, a different proof. The proof I'm giving you now is category theory in its purest form. If you don't like abstract category theory, then maybe have a look at the other proof in the book. So here is the abstract proof of this. So the first observation is that we can manipulate the representability result from last time to give us a similar representability result on the global homotopy category. So last time, or in lecture 5 more precisely, we showed that natural transformations of functors from spectra to sets from the functor pi 0g into some functor phi bijected with the value of phi at the unreduced suspension spectrum of the global classifying space of G and phi is some functor from orthogonal spectra to sets that takes global equivalences to bijections. And this was taking the natural transformation tau, taking the value first of all of this natural transformation at a particular orthogonal spectrum, namely the global classifying space of G, and then evaluating at the stable topological class. So this is a bijection, that's what we showed in lecture five. Now we have a functor that takes global equivalences to bijections. So as several times before, this functor descends to a functor on the global homotopy category by the universal property. And again, I will abuse notation and use the same name for this functor in the global homotopy category. Because now we're considering two functors, both of which take global equivalences to bijections, the natural transformations on this level of orthogonal spectra, or as functors on the global homotopy category, are actually the same, or more precisely, the localization functor induces a bijection between, on the one hand side, natural transformations as functors from the global homotopy category to sets from pi 0g to phi, and natural transformations as functors from orthogonal spectra to sets from pi 0g after gamma to pi 0 to phi after gamma. And now the abuse of notation is a little bit inconvenient here because as I said earlier, I should have really introduced a different name for the descended functor with some hat. And then I would have a hat here and this would be the original pi 0g with no hat here. But I think you understand what I mean. So that's a general consequence if we have a localization and then two functors, both of which descend to the localization. So that means that the representability result that we proved in lecture 5 for natural transformations as functors from spectra to sets also holds as natural transformations from the global homotopy category to sets. This can be reformulated in an even more abstract way, equivalently. It says that the pair pi 
zero G equivariant and the stable tautological class, it represents the functor. So from the category of functors, from the global homotopy category to sets, to sets, that evaluates the functor phi at the unreduced suspension spectrum of the global classifying space of G. So we're taking category theory really seriously here. We're going one category level higher than you might usually do. I mean, often when representing a functor, you have some functor from some category C to sets, and then it may or may not be representable. The category C is itself a functor category. So we're applying this to one level higher, and that is precisely what this statement is saying. If you combine this bijection with this bijection, then the the pair consisting of this particular functor from global homotopy category to sets, and this element in the value represents this functor. The representability property from lecture 5 means that a certain functor is representable, namely the functor which starts from the functor category of the global homotopy category functors to sets, two sets that evaluates the functor at a particular object, the global classifying space of G, unreduced suspension spectrum, that this functor is itself representable by the functor pi zero G and this element in the image. But of course, there's another pair that represents an evaluation functor. The unit dilemma tells us that also the pair consisting of the represented functor, sigma infinity plus E global G length and the identity of sigma infinity plus E global G, this represents the same functor, the same evaluation functor. And then, of course, representing objects are unique. So the uniqueness of representing objects. means, well, that there is a unique morphism between the two representing objects that takes one of the universal classes to the other universal class, and that morphism is an isomorphism. Now, in our situation, objects are already functors, so morphisms are natural transformations, so it means that the unique natural transformation from the represented functor to the other functor, and it's uniquely determined by sending the universal element here to the other universal element. So the unique natural transformation that sends the identity of sigma infinity plus E global G to the element EG is a natural isomorphism. A natural, an isomorphism of functors, so a natural isomorphism. And this is exactly the natural transformation that the theorem alluded to because it clearly takes the identity to E over G. So this is the end of the proof. As I already mentioned earlier, if this proof was too abstract for you, then you can find a slightly more concrete one in the Global Homotopy Theory book. And that one uses the fact that morphisms in the global stable homotopy category can be calculated as homotopy classes of morphisms as long as the source is flat or cofibrant and the target is a global omega spectrum. As I would like to explain now, the global stable homotopy category has another convenient property. It is what is called compactly generated. Let me introduce this notion. So we consider a triangulated category with infinite sums. So with arbitrary sums of arbitrary size. And we need the notion of a compact object, an object C of T is compact, and this is not to be confused with compact space or compact Lie group. And this notion is sometimes in the literature also called small, and sometimes it's called finite. If for every family of objects, 
indexed by some set. The canonical map from the direct sum over i and i, morphism groups from this object C into xi, and then two morphisms from C into the direct sum i and i xi with assumed that such a co-product exists, and this is an isomorphism. So it's always a morphism of abelian groups, and we're asking that it's bijective, and hence an isomorphism. For finite products, this would be automatic. It's a consequence of the fact that we have an additive category, so the substance here is for infinite co-products, whether or not this property holds. So that's what a, what's compact is. And then we need to, the notion of a set of weak generators. A set G of objects of T is a set of weak generators. The following holds. For all X objects in T, such that they have no morphisms from any object and any shift of any object in this set. So the set of morphisms from G shifted by K into X is zero for all G in this set of generators G and all integers K and Z. So whenever an object is invisible to the eyes of this generating set, then it's already zero. So the set of objects, and really all their suspensions and desuspensions, can see if an object is zero. And then it follows from the exact log exact sequence by mapping into distinguished triangles that these objects also detect whether a morphism is an isomorphism. If uh, you map out of all the shifts of all the elements in the set and you get a bijection, then a morphism was already an isomorphism. Weak generator is referring to the fact that there's an even stronger notion. You might ask for these to detect morphisms, so such that uh, when you have two morphisms that induce the same map, up, mapping out of all these generators and the shifts, they're already equal. This is a stronger notion, and that's not what we're considering. These objects only detect whether something is zero or when a morphism is an isomorphism. These do not detect when two morphisms are equal in general. So now we have the notion of compact objects and the set of weak generators, and when we have a set of weak generators consisting of compact objects, that's what a compact generator is. T, this triangulated category with infinite sums, is compactly generated if it has the set of compact weak generators. Before I give you examples of compactly generated triangulated categories, here's a useful fact. Suppose we have a triangulated category T, and suppose that it's compactly generated by a specific set of weak generators. And then you might wonder what do the compact objects look like? And the fact is that they are the thick subcategory generated by the set of compact objects. So Tc is the full subcategory consisting of the compact objects. And this means that we take the smallest thick subcategory, so that means triangulated subcategory that's also closed under retracts, that contains G, the set of generators. So in other words, we take the intersection of all triangulated subcategories that are also closed under retracts that contain G, that's the thick subcategory generated by G. And this consists of all the compact objects precisely. One direction is relatively straightforward. Um, these are by design compact objects, and if you close up under um, distinguished triangles and retracts, you never get out of this class. And the other direction is a little bit more complicated. So here's two possible references where you find this. 
This has a concrete content, namely this means that an arbitrary compact object build can be built up in finitely many steps from the generators by the following process. You start with a zero object, then you take an arbitrary but finite sum of shifts in positive or negative directions of your generators and you comb them off, of course, and you started with a zero object, you just get these objects and you keep doing this finitely many times. If you already have an object in this thick subcategory, you take a finite sum of suspensions or desuspensions of the generators and an arbitrary morphism onto the object which you already had, you comb it off, so you complete to a distinguished triangle, that gives you another um, object in the thick subcategory and then you have to do this finitely many times and at the very end you have to possibly pass to a retract and this is how you can construct all the compact objects. Here are some examples. So the first example is an algebraic one. We take a ring, let R be a ring, associative and with unit but not necessarily commutative the unbounded derived category of R is the following category. It's, it's a triangulated category. The typical notation is D of R, and the definition is you take chain complexes of R modules, Z-graded and not necessarily bounded, and you formally invert the quasi-isomorphisms. This actually is a triangulated category, and it is a compactly generated triangulated category, and it is, you can actually do with a single generator generated by R0. So we take that means we take the free R module of rank one of R itself. We consider it as a complex consisting only of this R in dimension 0 and 0 everywhere else, and then the differential necessarily have to be trivial. And the hint for proving this is that also we have a representability result. The key fact is that morphisms in the derived category from this particular complex into an arbitrary X is isomorphic to the zero homology group of R. This is the key thing you have to show. And that, of course, means that morphisms out of a shift of R detect the other homology group in all dimensions. So if there are no morphisms out of any of the shifts of R, then there's no homology, and that means because we've inverted quasi-isomorphisms, the object is zero. So this is telling you that this is a weak generator. Why is it compact? Well, that's because homology takes direct sums to direct sums. And then you can wonder what do the compact, look like, compact objects in this compactly generated triangulated category look like in general, and then an arbitrary compact object, an arbitrary compact object in the derived category of R is quasi-isomorphic to a bounded complex finitely generated projective R modules. So these are sometimes also called the perfect complexes. If you accept this fact up here, this is essentially an exercise that I recommend you doing, that this is a characterization of the compact objects. But here's also a reference to a paper by Bergstedt and Niemann. Now let's go to topological examples. So the next example is the stable homotopy category, the non-equivalent one. So which for which I write SH and this for example, we can take to be the category of orthogonal spectra, but now we formally invert not the global equivalences, but the non-equivalent pi star isomorphisms. This is a compactly generated triangulated category. With a sphere spectrum as also a single compact generator.
The hint for this is that similarly you have an isomorphism like this. So the hint is that morphisms in the non-equivalent homotopy category from the sphere spectrum into an arbitrary orthogonal spectrum X bijected with a non-equivalent zero homotopy group of X. So again, this means if there are no maps from any of the shifts of the sphere spectrum into X, X has trivial non-equivalent homotopy groups and hence it's a zero object. Also, homotopy groups take wedges to sums, so that means that this is a compact object. So it's a single compact weak generator. And then you can wonder what a general compact object looked like. A compact object of the stable homotopy category, the non-equivalent one, is always of the form. Now we take the suspension spectrum of a base finite GCW complex for some finite based CW complex X. And of course, if you apply an automorphism to a compact object, in particular the shift or a negative shift, you get a compact object again. If we shifted this in a positive direction, this would just be the suspension spectrum of some other CW complex and its suspension, but we, in the stable context, we can also shift down and we get more compact objects, and this is for some n greater equal to zero. So all the compact objects are essentially suspension spectra of finite CW complexes, possibly desuspended by some finite amount of times. This is a slightly more involved application of this general procedure, and I also give you a reference here. The next example is the G-equivariant stable homotopy category. So we let G be a compact E group. And then the G-equivariant stable homotopy category for which I'm going to write G as H is the category of orthogonal G spectra where the pi star underlined isomorphisms are formally inverted, and you know this also comes from various stable model structures. I've talked about this several times already. Then here, the set of suspension spectra of normal genus spaces for X and G running over all closed subgroups is a set of compact weak generators. And here the hint, of course, is again a representability result, namely that morphisms in the G equivalent stable homotopy category from the unreduced suspension spectrum of G mod H into some orthogonal G spectrum X that these naturally bijacked with pi zero H equivalent of X. And then there's also a characterization of what the compact objects look like, again, an application of the General criterion is the thick subcategory generated by the generators. A, a compact object of the G equivariant stable homotopy category is always of the form. So again, we can take the suspension spectrum of X, but now X is a finite G equivariant CW complex with some finite based G CW complex X. And then you can also desuspend, but now we have more possibilities to desuspend. We can also desuspend by representation spheres because smashing with representation spheres is invertible. So now we have to allow this. Um, and then some G representation V. And then in this case, we also have to allow retracts. So when G is a trivial group in the non-equivalent situation, it turns out you don't have to close up under retract. The class you first get by desuspending suspension spectra of equivalent CW complex is already closed under retracts, but here it's necessary to also close under retracts. Unfortunately, I don't know a reference in the published literature that states this in exactly this form, but this seems to be well known 
among experts and you can also get a proof if you take the general criterion and sort of work through what it explicitly means in these examples. And so you also use that there's an equivariant version of the Freudenthal suspension theorem that you know between finite equivariant things, stable maps after suspending with some representation eventually become unstable maps. If you put this all together, you can get a proof of this characterization. Now let's come to the case that we really care about, the global stable homotopy category. And let me write this down as a theorem, which maybe is the main result of today's lecture. It goes as following. The orthogonal spectra sigma infinity plus B global G for G in a set of representatives of the isomorphism classes of compact Lie groups. Form a set of weak compact weak generators for the global state homotopy category. In particular, the global stable homotopy category is a compactly generated triangulated category. If you already digested the arguments in the previous examples that I gave, then you can guess how the proof is going to proceed. Nevertheless, this is the key example for our purposes, so I actually want to give the proof in a little bit more detail. So let's first show that these objects are actually compact. For every compact group G. So we look at some family of orthogonal spectra. Xi, I, and I be a family of orthogonal spectra. And now what we have to do is we have to compare the direct sum of the morphism sets, sigma infinity plus B global G into X via the canonical map with morphisms from sigma infinity plus B global G into the direct sum of this orthogonal spectra X. I told you a little bit earlier that the direct sum in the global stable homotopy category is always without any condition on the orthogonal spectra represented by the wedge. So I can put the wedge here. Now we're going to use the representability result, which tells us that here we have an isomorphism given by in each of the summits evaluating at the stable topological class to the direct sum of the G equivalent homotopy groups, sorry, this should have had an index of the Xi's. And here we also have an isomorphism also given by evaluation at the stable topological class to pi zero G equivalent of the wedge over all I and I and Xi. And this is still the canonical map from the coproduct of a functor to the functor at the coproduct. And something which is really about G equivalent homotopy theory one group at a time is that G equivalent homotopy groups take wedges to direct sum. So this map is an isomorphism. The two vertical maps are isomorphisms by the representability. So we conclude that this is also an isomorphism. In other words, the global suspension spectrum, the suspension spectrum of the global classifying space is compact. And now, why are these weak generators? This is also similarly easy. Suppose that the morphisms from sigma infinity plus B global G into X shifted by some K. You now I have to test this for all integers K and then it makes no difference if I shift here with minus K or I shift in that variable with K. Suppose that these are all zero for all G and all K and Z, so for all compact Lie groups or just one in every isomorphism class, that is good enough. Well, by the representability result, this is isomorphic to pi zero G equivalent 
of x shifted by k. And the shifts in the positive directions are suspensions, the shifts in the negative dimensions are loops, and the suspension and the loop isomorphisms tell us that this is really pi minus k g equivalent of x. So we conclude that if an object looks as if it's zero through the eyes of all the shifts uh, in all directions of the global classifying space, then all its equivalent homotopy groups are zero. So this, of course, means that x is zero in the global stable homotopy category. So the global classifying spaces of the compact Lie groups run in every isomorphism class detect whether objects are zero. This proves that the global stable homotopy category is compactly generated. That's the main result of today. In the next lecture, I will talk about formal consequences that this compact generation has, such as Brown representability and the existence of various adjoints. But I would like to close for today and thank you for your attention.